Okay, are we ready? Lesson 11 on cults, heresies, and false, oh so very false doctrines, such as the idea that you could lose your salvation. So we'll talk about eternal security versus conditional salvation this evening. The discussion at hand is once you are saved, is that salvation forever? Or is it something that can be lost? Now, I understand almost didn't even talk about this because we've heard about this in so many different sermons and messages in different ways. But I thought maybe it would be beneficial to get it all in one place because sometimes, especially with this subject, we kind of deal with it here and there as we go. Here's a couple of verses that we came along and you know make mention of it. I thought maybe it would be helpful to just get all this information in one spot so you could reference it, know where it is, and have it all presented to you there. Um, so the question is, can I can I lose my salvation? Is there something I can is there a sin I can commit that will cause my salvation to be taken from me? Can I give my salvation back if I want to give it back? If I decide I don't want to be saved any longer, if I decide I don't believe in Jesus any longer, what happens? The Bible teaches, and so we believe in what we call eternal security. This is the truth that once you are saved, you are secure eternally, and that you're unable to lose your salvation for any reason. Okay? The false and unfortunately very prevalent idea that we'll be refuting is conditional salvation, which is the idea that your salvation is conditional on your works or conditional on you keeping the faith or on conditional conditional upon you remaining in a certain uh, level of good works or certain belief in Jesus that you could somehow give your salvation back. Um, that's conditional salvation and not true according to the Bible. So why is this so important? Well, number one, if you don't understand eternal security, you will never have full assurance of salvation. You will never have full assurance of salvation. Obviously, if you think that it's possible to lose your salvation, you'll be constantly wondering if you still have your salvation. If you believe that it's possible for your salvation to be lost, then you will be robbed of the joy and the peace and the assurance that grows out of knowing that you're saved. There's nothing more blessed in all the world to say that I know that I'm going to heaven when I die, that I can live my life and today might not be so great and tomorrow might not be so great either and my future prospects on this earth might be less than comfortable or less than satisfactory. Not saying that's my case, but maybe, maybe that is one day or maybe it's yours or maybe it will be. Whatever the case, whatever you deal with, I know that I'm going to go to heaven when I die. I know that I'm saved. I know that I'll never once have to worry about hellfire. I'll never once have to worry about judgment. I'll never once have to worry about eternal judge. I know I'm going to heaven when I die. And that's just such a wonderful peace and wonderful assurance that makes you love the Lord that much more. And you'll never have that peace and that assurance if you believe you can lose your salvation because you'll be relying on something totally unreliable that is yourself. If I were depending on me, whether or not I'll go to heaven, I would be very, very uncertain. Well, no, let me rephrase that. I'd be very, very certain. I'd be certain I wouldn't be going to heaven. If I were dependent on any of my works after salvation, there'd be a very uncertainty. Uh, am I good enough? Have I done enough? Have I believed right? Have I, have I repented of all my sins that I could think of? Did I say sorry for everything I did wrong today? Did, is my heart right or is my heart not right? I'm not, I'm not depending on any of those things. I'm depending on what Jesus Christ said. He died for me. He said, if I believe on him, he'll take me to heaven. And so you don't have that peace and that assurance if you believe you can lose your salvation. Number two, you will split good churches or not those who believe that their salvation are not content to remain in a Bible-believing church. They almost always leave and often do what they can to hurt the congregation on their way out. I know a lot of people who believe that lose their salvation, and very few of them are in church. And those that were in church have really just caused problems in that church. It then results in a futile search for a church. Right. I'm right about this doctrine, and no one else is right about this doctrine, so I guess I can't fellowship with anybody anywhere. Or... I'm so holy and so righteous that I can keep my salvation, but everybody around me can lose their salvation because they're not as holy and righteous as I am, and so I can't fellowship with them. Number three, you'll be stunted in your Christian growth. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter number six. Hebrews six. 
The Bible teaches that salvation is supposed to be the starting point of the Christian life, but then, as odd as it might sound, you're supposed to move on past salvation. You're not supposed to remain there. You're not supposed to just, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, and never get go on to anything else. Okay, I'm not saying you get over your sal- oh, get over it and move on with your life. That's not what I'm saying. I still glory in my salvation daily and wonder in my salvation daily. But look, look what it says. Therefore, verse number one, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment, and this will we do if God permit. The Bible says those are the principal things. Those are the starting places. Those are the baby steps. And once you have those things down, you're supposed to move on past those things and get on to deeper things and get on to other things and progress in your Christian life. Those that believe they can lose their salvation and then get their salvation back and then lose their salvation and then get their salvation back will never move on to perfection. They'll always be caught in that one spot of, I'm saved or am I? I'm saved or did I lose it? I'm saved, do I need to get saved again? And the Bible says once you get saved, Okay, that's the most wonderful thing that's ever happened to you, and we're not saying just forget about it, but we're saying that happened there, and I know where it happened, and now I'm moving on. I'm progressing. I'm growing. I'm not here. I'm saved, and then I go back to that, and then I go back to that, and go back to that. Okay, somebody that can't get any assurance of salvation will be a Hebrews 6.1 sort of person, always going back to that, going back to the repentance, going back to the faith towards God, and not being able to progress in their Christian life. A lot of these churches... You know, you go and every single service is about salvation. Oh, that's, the, that's what we're supposed to preach. We're supposed to preach the gospel. You're supposed to preach the gospel out there, but in here we're supposed to go on to some other things and teach all the Bible and all the counsel of God. And so a lot of churches are stunted in their growth because the only thing they teach every single week, every single service is salvation, 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 salvation. And so if you believe you can lose your salvation, you'll be a stunted sort of Christian. So very, very important that you believe correctly about this matter. Let's talk about the contradictory lifestyle of those who believe they can lose their salvation, and then <clears throat> we will get into the Bible verses. <clears throat> the contradictory lifestyle of those who believe they can lose their salvation. What do we mean? Almost always, those who believe they can lose their salvation do not live like they are trying to keep their salvation. Almost always. You would think if somebody believed they could lose their salvation, that they would be living the best Christian life you've ever seen. You would think they would be very, very careful to be very strict in their Christianity because they believe it's possible they lose their salvation and end up in hell. But that's generally not the case. In this, in this area, generally... The churches that believe they can lose their salvation are not the most conservative of churches, are not the most conservative in their doctrine or in their dress or in their actions or in their conduct at church. They're the more liberal churches. So generally, those that believe they can lose their salvation aren't living a life that looks like they're trying to keep a salvation. Maybe that's a broad brush, but it seems accurate, all of the ones that I know. Most groups that believe that salvation can be lost have an ever-changing definition of what it would take to lose your salvation, and that definition never includes anything that they have done or want to do. Whenever you ask them, okay, well, what is it? If I, if I can lose my salvation, what is it that can cause me to lose my salvation? It is really, really hard to get a concrete and definite answer out of any one of these people. It's always... Well, that's between you and the Lord. Well, it's it's a heart attitude. Well, it's not sin. It's if you sin with and you mean to sin, or you want to sin, or you sin and you don't repent, or you or you you commit some really really bad sin that I would never do, and I don't do, and I don't want to do. But you know, those people that do that thing, that's what you could cause you to lose your salvation. And it's always different, and it's always changing, and it's always unsure. And don't you think? I mean, this is a serious matter, right? We're talking about heaven and hell. 
We're not talking about, you know, am I going through the trip? Not that that's not serious, but we're not talking about am I going through the tribulation or not going through We're talking about am I going to heaven for all eternity or will I burn in a lake of fire for all eternity? Don't you think it's fair to say that if, if I could lose my salvation, the Bible would be very, very clear on what I'd have to do in order to lose my salvation? It would be just as clear about the possibility of me ending up back in hell as it was about me being bound for hell in the first place. It would be just as clear about me being able to lose my salvation and how I could lose it than it would be about the fact that I could get saved and how I could get saved. And so the definition is always seems to be changing. Okay, so how about what does the Bible say? What does the Bible? Here we're going to go through a bunch of points according to the Bible that show that you cannot lose your salvation. We're going to try to take the time to turn to most of them and explain them. We won't have time to get into those verses that maybe make it look like you could lose your salvation, but we'll give you an explanation that works for all of those uh, in light of all of these. So, number one, salvation is eternal. Salvation is eternal. There are many places in the Bible that states that our salvation is either eternal or everlasting. When you get saved, you have God's promise, everlasting life. The term in the Bible always used, you have eternal life. You have everlasting life. How long is everlasting? How long is eternal? It's forever. And so if God has given me, as a saved man, everlasting life, I can be sure of the fact that that life that he's given me is everlasting. It's not going anywhere, else it wouldn't be everlasting life. It would be conditional life. It would be temporary life. It would be maybe everlasting life. But he says, I've given you, you're not going to die. Look at, look at Jude 6. book of Jude and verse number 6. And the angels was kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved into everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Okay, look at Revelation 20. Revelation 20. Look at verse number 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. How long is the forever of hell? Right? If you die in your sins, you go to everlasting death. Do you not know what the Bible says? How long is hell? It's everlasting. Is there any hope of hell being cut short? No. Is there any hope of hell? Everlasting destruction, a lake of fire being for maybe only a thousand years or maybe until they get right or no. Everlasting hell is everlasting. You will not get out of hell. Okay, The Bible says that God is everlasting in Psalm 90 uh, and Psalm 93. From, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. How long is the everlasting in regards to God? Is it in any way temporary? Is there anything that could happen to make God less than forever or less than everlasting? So why is it when we come to a verse that says hell is everlasting, we understand that means forever, no exceptions. And we come to a verse that says God is everlasting, we understand that means forever, no exceptions. But when we come to a verse that says salvation is everlasting, and now there's a bunch of exceptions. John 3.16, John 5.24, Romans 6.23, and of course many, many more scriptures say that salvation is everlasting life. And everlasting life is a possession. It's not this obscure, you know, I have it. It's mine. I have everlasting life. I am never going to die. Period. That's what God has promised me. Number two, this is great. Sin is not imputed. Sin is not imputed. The entire idea behind losing your salvation is that there is something that you can do that is bad enough to cause you to lose your salvation, whether that be a particular sin or a turning back from faith in Jesus, which is also a sin. It's hard to imagine any sin causing you to lose your salvation when the Bible says that sin is not imputed to me. So the idea is there's some 
big sin out there. Usually it's, you know, murder or adultery or some sort of terrible, terrible sin that if I commit those, you know, specific category, category of sins, then, then I can lose my salvation. But the Bible says that sin's not imputed to me. What does imputed mean? It means charged to the account of, attributed or ascribed. So when I sin, the Bible says that sin is not charged to my account. How could I be held accountable for even a really big sin if the Bible says that none of my sins are charged to my account? Okay, if tomorrow I lie, that's a terrible thing, and I'm going to reap what I've sown, and I'm going to be, right? But that lie is not charged to my account. I'm not held accountable for it. God looks at my record. God looks at my account and says, I just see the righteousness of Jesus Christ, all clear, good to go. If tomorrow, God forbid, I were to commit adultery, or if I were to murder somebody, uh, there would be serious consequences for that sin. But when God looks at my eternal record as my judge, my state before God would still be the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Look at Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter number 4. Probably my favorite portion of Scripture in all the Bible is these first few verses in Romans 4. Look what it says. What shall we say? Then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. I don't come to God with my righteousness, I come to God with faith. Verse number four, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So I come to God with my faith, not my works. I say, I believe that you died on the cross, was buried, rose again three days, three nights later. He applies his righteousness to my account. And if that's where it stopped, we'd be in trouble. I need more than just his righteousness on my account. I need to make sure that my future sins are also not going to be applied to my account. Look at verse number six. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of, of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So the Bible says this imputation of righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ comes with an additional blessing. And it's the fact that not only do I have Jesus' righteousness on my account, but all my sins will not be imputed to me. And he points to David as an example, a man who committed murder and a man who committed adultery and says, just like I didn't impute David's sin to him, I won't impute your sin to to you. So the reason that I know that I'm not going to hell when I die is not because I'm a good person or I've kept it or I've, I've whatever. I've trusted in Jesus Christ and anything I've done since then, the Bible says, has not been imputed to my account. He called something that is not as though it were. He put Jesus' righteousness in my place and when he looks at me, he sees Jesus Christ. What a blessing. Look at uh, Romans 6, since we're in the neighborhood. Look at Romans 6. Look at verse number 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. You're not under the law, but under grace. Look at verse number 5, uh, Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 13, probably just right across the page. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. What does the Bible say in Romans 6? I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. What does the Bible say in Romans 5? Sin is not imputed where there is no law. No law here. I'm under grace, not the law. The law has no power over me. Entire book of Galatians. The law was my schoolmaster to bring me to Christ, but once I've learned the lesson, I'm no longer under the schoolmaster. I am not under the law. There is no law. And so the Bible says sin is not imputed where there is no law. Praise the Lord. Number three. Jesus cannot deny himself. He can't deny himself. Look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. This is where people begin to say, well, 
There's no sin, perhaps, that can cause you to lose your salvation, but you could give your salvation up. It can't be taken from you, but you can give, you know, you can give that gift back. You can, you can say that I don't believe in Jesus Christ anymore. I, I, I was silly for trusting him, or I've decided I don't want salvation anymore. God, you can take it back. I want to live for myself. Look at what 2 Timothy chapter number 2 says, verse number 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So you know what happens? I get saved and I'm immediately baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And I am now not Kyle Hillman in Kyle Hillman's body. I am a member of Jesus Christ's body. I'm placed into his body of which he is the head, and I am a part of him. I'm not an individual any longer. I'm baptized into Christ. I'm in his body. I am part of himself. He is in me, and I in him. We are one. And for him to deny me would be for him to deny himself. For him to cast me off would be to take a part of his body body and remove it, rip it away from his own body and ostracize it for himself. It would be an amputation. And the Bible says, although I might deny him, he is going to abide faithful to me. And no matter how unfaithful I might be to him, Jesus Christ is going to be faithful to me. It is impossible for him to deny himself because I've been put into him. So I have no plans of turning my back on Jesus Christ. I have no plans of giving back my salvation. I have no plans of denying the faith and walking away. But if I ever did, I'm a part of his body and he cannot deny himself. Along those same lines, number four, we cannot be plucked out of his hand. Look at John chapter number 10. John chapter number 10. <laughs> Look at verse number 28, John 10, 28. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You see, they're, they're, it doesn't say any man shall take them out of my hand. If I've got, if I've got an item in my hand that I'm just holding and you were to, you wouldn't pluck that, right? You'd take that. But if you were to if you were to pull a hair out of my skin, you would pluck that out. Why? Because it's a part of me. It's it's inside of me. And you'd have to pluck you know what you say? You are you are inside of Jesus Christ. You're part of Jesus Christ. Now it says, Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That includes me. Nobody's going to take me out of Jesus Christ's hand, not even me. I'm part of any man, aren't I? So nobody can remove me from Jesus Christ. I can't remove me from Jesus Christ. Nobody out there and my myself cannot remove myself from Jesus Christ. Number five, the Bible says that we are sealed. We are sealed. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. <laughs> Verse number 21. Now, he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Come to Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians 1 and also Ephesians 4. Ephesians 1.13 in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. This sealing speaks of preserving. Uh, you ever open a can of something, a can of preserves, that can has been sealed. And you've got a food inside of that can that if left unsealed would corrupt right would rot i mean if you just if you took a jar and you put uh strawberries in that jar strawberry jelly in that jar and you just closed it and put it in the cabinet no ceiling you know what would happen 
it wouldn't be long. <laughs> You'd have some moldy strawberry jelly. But you go through the canning process and that seal, that can seals, you could put that thing in the cabinet for months, maybe even years, and pop it open and it's just as fresh as the day you canned it. That's what's being spoken of. We're sealed by the Holy Ghost. We're preserved by the Holy Ghost. Look at chapter number 4, verse number 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Okay, number six, saved people are sinful. How is this a proof that you can't lose your salvation? Well, if a person could lose your salvation, we would all have lost our salvation because all saved people are sinful people. You have, ha you, you have to have an unholy level of pride to think that Jesus Christ and keeping your salvation. You have to have a satanic level of pride to believe that you are somehow keeping yourself saved. Because if there was a way for us to lose it, we'd lose it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more momentarily. But Romans chapter number 7 shows the greatest Christian that ever lived and says that he's just in sin, in his flesh. In his flesh dwelleth no good thing. And then 1 John 1, 8. Let's look at this, 1 John chapter number 1. 1 John chapter number 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Bible says, look, you're sinful. And if you say you're not, you're a liar, and you're calling God a liar. And the Bible says, if any man does sin, they have a propitiation. Jesus Christ, they have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the propitiation for our sins. So, there's no qualifications, no conditions placed on chapter number 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, if you sin, any sin, you have an advocate with God, Jesus. He's not going to forsake you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to turn his back on you. He's not going to deny you. He's not going to quit arguing your case before God. You have an advocate and a propitiation for your sins. Your sins have been paid for by Jesus Christ, no matter what they are, even if you sin after salvation. So all saved people are sinful. Number seven, breaking one point of the law is to break all the law. Go a few books back to the book of James. Breaking one point of the law is to break all the law. James chapter number 2. Look at verse number... Um, 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point... He is guilty of all. So if we're looking at this thing as you need to keep certain laws in order to be saved, in order to keep your salvation, if that's really how we're approaching this, the Bible says you commit one point in the law. You break one point in the law. You offend one point in the law. You're guilty of all of them. That means if you covet, you're guilty of breaking the law. See, the sin isn't, you look at individual sins, well, I, I didn't you know, commit adultery, I might have told a lie, I didn't, I didn't murder anybody, I might have you know, loved my neighbor as myself, I didn't, you know, I didn't s s steal anything, but you know, maybe, maybe I did a, a smaller, the Bible says there's just one sin, law-breaking. You commit one, you're guilty of breaking the law of God, you're guilty of all of it and so deserve hell. So you can't start classifying as, well, these are, you know, salvation-losing sins, and these are, you know, not salvation-losing sins. The Bible says you do a little sin, you're, you're guilty of them all. Okay? Now, I'll, I'll agree, and the Bible teaches that not all sins are the same. Okay? There are big sins and little sins in the eyes of God when it comes to your state. If I commit adultery, the repercussions are going to be much greater than if I tell a little white lie, right? I mean, can we, can we agree? I'm not saying it's okay to tell a little white lie, but if I told you, you know, now and then I lose my temper, you'd say, well, you know, that's a sin, but pretty normal. And if I told you, 
now and then I commit adultery. <laughs> you, those are two <laughs> different things. And we all understand that. And the, reper <laughs> the repercussions for that, the punishments for that would be, nobody's going to you know, remove me from fellowship because now and then I you know, lose my temper. But I'd be removed from fellowship if now and then I commit adultery, right? So there, there are differences. There are big sins and little sins. But when it, comes to my, when it comes to my standing before God, when it comes to my eternity, when it comes to heaven or hell, if I have any sin imputed to me at all, then I'm going to hell. If there's any sin on my record at all, I am hell-bound and deservedly so because I'm a transgressor of the law. So when we're talking about, you know, well, there's some sins that God... Well, you've got to say, to believe this way, you've got to say there's some sins that God are, is okay with and some sins that God's not okay with. If you believe you can lose your salvation only for big sins but not for little sins, you've got to say the blood of Jesus Christ covers these sins, but it doesn't cover these sins. God's going to let these little things in your life slide, but he's not going to let the big things in your life slide. And the Bible says, if man, if you mess up, you mess up. If you sin, you're a sinner, and sinners go to hell. Sinners go to the lake of fire. That's why we need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Understand what I say? That makes me not a sinner. Now, in my flesh, there dwells no good thing, but before God... Judgmentally, I am, I am clean as Jesus Christ. I am righteous as Jesus Christ. I, I, I trust you understand what I mean when I say I don't live like Jesus Christ. I don't live righteously, but that's how God sees me. And so, so important. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You break any little commandment, it shows God. It's a lack of love for God. So breaking one point of law is equal to breaking the entirety of the law. Number eight, all my sins were future when Christ died on the cross. If Christ went to the cross and died for my sin, that means he died for every sin that I would commit. Did he not? He died for anything that I would do wrong. So that means tomorrow, if I lose my temper, sin, because I'm selfish, sin, and covetous, sin, and I punch someone in the face, sin, and steal their stuff, sin. That's all been paid for on the cross of Jesus Christ when he died for me. And so that sin cannot be imputed to my account because it's already been paid for. You'll say, well, you know, when you get saved, he takes away your sin, but not your future sin. It was all in the future when he went to the cross. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. No, wait, wait, wait. First Peter, first first Peter two, because you're right there. First Peter two, verse number twenty four. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Which of my sins were in his body on the tree when he died? All of them. Are you going to say that Jesus didn't die for murder? Are you going to say Jesus didn't die for a dog? Are you going to say there's only some sins he died? No, my sins were in his body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Now look at 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Christ was made sin for me. What sin? all of my sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Number nine, salvation is not of yourself. It was never of you in the first place. What makes you think that it's yours to keep? Of course, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, I go to heaven not boasting of my good works. Okay, If a certain amount of righteousness to keep my salvation is so, then that means that one man goes to hell because he didn't live up to it after salvation, and I go to heaven after I get saved, and I could say, I got to go to heaven because I lived it right. I didn't do the big mess up after I got, and that guy did, but I could boast in my own good works. The Bible says that salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Galatians 2, verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am saved by faith, and I am kept by faith, but not my faith. The Bible says the life 
that I'm living, I live in the faith of the Son of God. I am kept by Jesus' faith. I am kept by the faith of the Son of God. It's not even my faith anymore that's doing the keeping. It's not even my faith. It's Jesus' faith. And I am, I am living in that faith. What a blessed thing. Number 10, Jesus promised to continue his work in you. Philippians 1 verse 6 says, Being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I got saved and Christ began something in me. And the Bible says that he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Number 11, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans chapter number 8, verses 38 through 39. That would include my sin, the big ones, the little ones. And lastly, number 12, get Jude 24, along with Ephesians 5. Jude 24 and Ephesians 5. Number 12, God keeps us and presents us to himself. The Bible clearly states that God does the keeping, God does the cleaning, and God ultimately is responsible for my safe presentation before him. Look at, look at Jude verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of, the, of his glory with exceeding joy. How am I going to be kept from falling and presented faultless? Not by me, by him. He's the one doing the work. He's the one doing the keeping. He's the one doing the cleaning and the presenting. Look at Ephesians 5, verse number 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. This process is going to result in verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. The Bible says one day that I'm going to be presented to Jesus Christ as his bride, and I'm going to be perfect. I'm going to be spotless. I'm going to be without blemish, and it's not going to be because of me and my works and my keeping and my doing and my cleaning. He's going to present me to himself. He's going to take me and wash me by his word and clean me and Say, okay, now that I've done this work through your life and through the, through the you know, uh, redemption of your body and all that, I now I'm going to take you and present you to myself as my spotless bride. It's not me. It's not my work. It's what Jesus Christ is doing in me and through me and for me of his own power. Okay, now quickly, verses that make it appear that we can lose your salvation. We're not going to give you any of them. We're not going to talk about them. I know that's what we usually try to do. We just don't have time for that. But there are a few verses in the Bible that are twisted to make it look like you could lose your salvation. I am confident in your ability to correctly interpret these verses in light of the truths that we just learned. We just looked at 12 irrefutable proofs saying you can't lose your salvation. There's no way that those verses mean what people say that they mean. There's no way because it would contradict the scripture. Almost always a verse that seems to teach you can lose your salvation is simply being misinterpreted or taken out of context, and usually pretty simply. People take a verse that's dealing with holy living and the fact that we should live right and apply it to salvation. People will talk, take a verse talking about uh, losing your joy or losing your righteousness or losing your standing with God, losing something temporary in your life and apply it to losing your salvation. Okay, A simple under... And what's being taught is the easiest way to deal with these verses. For example, Galatians chapter number 5 is so clearly talking about living by the law or living by grace. If you know the context of the chapter of, of uh, context of the chapter and of the book, those verses become so clear. Suddenly falling from grace, like we just you know just learned about, right? In Galatians 5, suddenly falling from grace is not, oh, I've lost my salvation. It's well, I'm not living under the grace that I could be living. I'm living under the law. Why would I live under the law when I could live under grace? And so just a little bit of context and a little bit of scripture understanding makes every one of those so-called proofs for losing your salvation so, so very clear. So I'm glad that I'm saved. I'm glad I'm not going to lose it. 
And that gives me the confidence and the desire to live my life for Jesus Christ. Well, I, th I thought I couldn't lose my salvation. I wouldn't, you know, what's to stop me from going out and sinning? Nothing except your love for Jesus. Nothing about except your wonder for the fact that you have a Savior that would keep you and preserve you and love you and present you. And why would you not want to live right? Why would you not want to live clean? Jesus is just so great and so wonderful and so good to us. It ought to, just, just his love for you ought to make you want to live for him. I don't need hell hanging over my head to make me live right. I just the, the wonder that is my Savior makes me want to live for him. So praise the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for this time that we had together. Thank you for saving us and keeping us. Lord, thank you for this confidence that we couldn't go to hell even if we wanted to. And we're so, so glad for that truth. Lord, pray for those that don't believe this way. Help us to be faithful, to convince them of the assurance that they could have in Jesus Christ. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Any questions?